just want to thank you guys all so much for coming. It's sort of like planning a party and hoping that people show up. And there is like <laughs> an amazing turnout. I'm like, I hope people come and find this as interesting as I do. Um, so, and then um, thank you to HIMS, the Washington chapter of HIMS um, and Cambia Grove for hosting this. Um, one of the missions of Seattle Health Innovators is to really bring together community partnerships. Um, and so it was really important to us to try to put together events with um, other community organizations. So um, thank you to them. Um, this is actually a three series event. Um, so tonight is on career resiliency. And then next month, we're doing an event on um, how to move into leadership roles. And then the last event will be in October. Um, <laughs> the last one in October will be um, on developing your personal brand. Oh, I see it now. All right, there we go. Um, so yes, we invite you to come to those events. Um, we put together some other really great panels um, for those as well. Um, a few minor housekeeping things. Bathrooms are down there, um, the hall to the left. Um, and then we also are offering um, one hour of continuing professional education credit um, for each one of these events. So if you need that for your licensure, your job, or you just want a little certificate that says you are here, um, you can see Kaylee. Um, I think they were sort of checking people in at the front desk for that. Um, so we've put together a really great panel. I'm really excited about it. Um, but one quick audience poll. Um, who out there is a clinician? Like nurse, doctor, nurse, AP. All right, great, we have a lot of clinicians. That's exciting. Um, and then anyone here from the business side? And then design and product? Um, what else? Uh, life sciences? And then informatics? Awesome, we have like a really good mix and diverse audience, which is really exciting too. Um, so today, um, I'm gonna let the panelists all introduce themselves, but the focus of this panel was really um, born out of Kaylee and I recently graduated from a, a master's program at the University of Washington, and we didn't really have any resources or mentors when we were in graduate school to help um, lead us down a career path. Um, but I think there's also now um, people at any point in their career, there is no one career ladder. You don't really just work for one company anymore. So, um, and most of our events are on subject matters like digital health or mobile health. Um, and so we haven't really done anything on careers. So we really saw that there was a need for that. And there is, because all of you are here tonight. Um, so one part of this is the panel's personal experiences because they all come from really diverse backgrounds and work for really diverse places. And then the second part is just on um, where we see technology and innovation going and how to be resilient to look ahead um, in market trends. And also it's not so much about um, how do I get a job in XYZ? It's how do I develop my skill set um, to remain resilient, not only within my organization, but um, to move into other organizations and how to develop some of those skill sets. Um, so I have a list of questions here for the panelists, and then um, I will do that for probably 30, 35 minutes, and then there's such a large audience, so I'll just turn it over to audience questions for the last half. Um, so first of all, I'm just going to let everyone introduce themselves, um, just the current company that you work for, um, your career path into healthcare technology and innovation. Um, did you choose healthcare or did it choose you and um, why have you stayed or why have you left? Um, my name is Melissa Di Capua, and I'm a design researcher at Microsoft right now. But I actually started my career as a psychiatric nurse practitioner. I guess I'm still a psychiatric nurse practitioner, at heart at least. Um, my career path was um, kind of, I didn't choose it consciously, I guess. It just kind of happened. I practiced clinically for a couple of years in psychiatry. And then um, there was this movement that required nurse practitioners to have their doctorate degree to continue practicing. So I went back to school, 
got my doctorate degree, and that was about the same time the Affordable Care Act was kind of coming to fruition and being passed. So there was a lot of, I guess, kind of opportunity to start um, talking to people about that. So a, diff a variety of different kind of technology companies approached me at that time to ask me questions about how health policy was working at the time, and I just kind of kind of went with it. I was a little nervous because <laughs> I wasn't sure I knew all the ins and outs, but I kind of just went with it and one opportunity led to another and now I'm working at Microsoft. Hello, my name is Cassie Wallander. I'm Chief Product Officer at a startup here in Seattle called Invio, and we are working to make clinical trials cheaper and with better data quality and faster access to their data. Um, I, I won't go into the nitty gritty of how quite yet, but um, I got to this place and got into life sciences SAS via a series of fortunate events. Um, I started out my career as a microsystems analyst at a university and was recruited off LinkedIn to join a startup, which I thought was crazy. But uh, I, I was a friendly, helpful person, so I said to the man, I'm very comfortable, but I'll meet you for coffee, and maybe I could uh, help you find the person you're looking for in my network. And by, that was Friday. By Monday, he had me turning in my two weeks and joining his startup, and the adventure had begun. Um, that first startup was called I Like. It was a music social recommendation service that was later, uh, was very big on Facebook, and we invented the like. <laughs> uh, and but was eventually acquired ironically by <coughs> MySpace. Um, <laughs> so uh, from there, I joined another startup after about a year at MySpace. Um, I was a product manager at MySpace and, and worked on a redesign of the events side of things for MySpace, which was interesting because it's still like the ninth biggest website. But um, after a while, I decided I had to go back to startup land. And that's when I um, met a startup in Seattle called Aperture uh, that was working in life sciences. And that's when I really fell in love with the idea that I could use my nerd powers for good to drive better healthcare outcomes for people. Uh, and that has since been a pivot in my life that I don't think I'll ever look back on because I've really fallen in love with it. And uh, that company was acquired. And then I went on to found Invio. Uh, so that's my story in a nutshell. Hi, my name is Mark Long. I work for Providence Health. I run a group called Digital Innovation, which you can think of as kind of an internal tech startup inside of a large health system. So I'm kind of had a very circuitous route. I spent the first decade of my life um, as a hardcore nerd doing space robotics for NASA. Um, then I kind of got burned out on the whole R&D world, and then the next uh, couple years I spent in two startups and a turnaround, and everybody thought I was insane with a French freshly minted PhD from Caltech. I was employee number 23 at a company called paymybills.com, which was before there was online bill pay. We built online bill pay. You're welcome. Um, <laughs> because my, uh, my beach blanket is worth more than my stock, but that's a whole nother story. Um, and so I had a series of, um, of startups that were a lot of fun. I always say you learn a lot by doing things wrong. And so we kind of went along the way. And the second startup was struggling. And one of the things that we fell into was the elementary school friend of the founder was, um, was in a health um, as a medical device company. And so we bunch started doing a bunch of work uh, for his company. And I won't go into the details, but it basically allowed me to put my hat on that says, I know something about healthcare, which I really didn't. I was still a CTO kind of guy of running a software company. Um, but the next job was, hey, we need somebody who knows software and healthcare. And since I could BS my way a little bit and said, hey, I worked on healthcare products, they said, you're the guy because nobody else understands healthcare. Anyway, um, my third career really is kind of in the big world. And so um, after that company, I kind of, again, took a hard left turn and said, I'm looking for something different. I don't know what. Amazon called and they said, hey, move to Seattle. And uh, another long story I won't go into, but Amazon and I did not get along very well. And so after a year, Providence called and said, hey, we'd like you to run a startup. And we're starting this whole new thing about innovation and let's go build an engineering team and let's kind of change healthcare. And so here we are on that road. Thanks, um, I'll introduce myself as well. Um, um, my, originally, my undergrad is in neurobiology, so I was always sort of 
geared towards something in healthcare. I went back and got my um, post back in nursing um, and have worked as a registered nurse in the neuro ICU at Swedish um, and the trauma ICU at Harborview because I didn't think the neuro ICU was hard enough. Um, and that was a really good learning experience. Um, and then uh, I currently work in the PACU, which is the post-anesthesia care unit. Um, and after those three years in nursing, I sort of knew that being at the bedside wasn't going to be something that I was going to be able to do for a lifetime. Um, it's really hard work. Um, you're on your feet a lot, and um, it's really draining. And I people kept coming to me and asking me to fix all their um, epic and Cerner problems. So um, I was like, oh, maybe I should get a graduate degree in clinical informatics. So um, I did that. And then sort of born out of that was um, I basically now work for five or six different surgery centers, still clinically nursing, um, but sort of work for a bunch of them. Um, but in the interim, during my graduate school, there's a project at the university called Empower. Um, and it's a mobile post-operative wound evaluator. Um, and I really fell in love with that project because um, I work in surgery and I'm always sending people home after surgery being like, good luck, I hope you don't have anything go wrong because we don't really have a lot of resources for you. But this was a mobile app designed for people to take pictures of their surgical site post-operatively and be able to share it um, with their clinicians to see if they were developing a surgical site infection. Um, so that's sort of how I moved into the mobile health technology. And then I just go to a lot of events. You may or may not have seen me around in conferences and heard um, Mike Van Snellenberg, the CTO of Well Pepper, speak at one of them. And they had done some research um, with their mobile app on getting Parkinson's patients to um, use their app to do exercises. And Parkinson's patients usually have a pretty steady decline, but with the app uh, Well Pepper and the university they were working with, they actually had an increase in mobility, which is a pretty huge deal for that particular disease. And with my neurobiology degree, I thought that was awesome. So um, I just sort of monitored Well Pepper until I saw that they were hiring um, for sales, which I am not a salesperson at all, and just sent them a resume. And they were like, we don't want you for sales, but we want you for your healthcare experience. Um, so I ended up working for them for about a year um, doing everything from marketing, sales, product development, design, research, all of the things um, that you get to do in a startup. And then <clears throat> now I'm teaching at the University of Washington um, clinically for nursing students out in the hospitals, um, not doing anything technology-wise, which is why this is also interesting to me because I'm trying to determine how I'm going to move back into technology and healthcare innovation as well. So. Um, so I guess the first question I have is um, for you all. Um, do you think you need healthcare experience to break into the healthcare technology sector? Um, and what are some ways you can gain that experience if you're not already in the field? <laughs> um, I, I joined Aperture without any life sciences technology experience. But like most startups, you do many things you don't know how to do. <laughs> and I learned a lot at that first at that first life sciences startup about um, the ecosystem that we were working in. Um, I didn't even know that HCP stood for healthcare provider when we started. <laughs> and by the time I left, like I understood the ramifications of uh, compliance issues, HIPAA issues, the ecosystems between payers, providers, um, HCPs, and uh, patients. And uh, it was a great learning experience. So one way I would recommend, based on my experience, is if you need to get into something, any area, whether it's life science or another area, and you don't know how to get your foot in the door, go join a startup, because um, it will be really hard and it'll be really tough and you probably won't make any money, but you'll learn a lot and you'll have to wear many, many hats and uh, say, yes, I can figure that out to many, many things. And along the way, you'll discover the things you hate doing, the things you love doing. So it's a great way to double down on finding your path of happiness as well. So I, I just want to echo that. That quote, yes, I can figure it out, I think is the key to any job. And 
So if the question is, do you need a healthcare experience, it all depends on the hiring manager. I can't tell you the number of conversations I've been where like, that's a great person, but they don't have healthcare experience. It's true conversations. I said, we have 110,000 people who know healthcare in and out. What I really need is a great designer. What I really need is a great data scientist. Mm -hmm. So you, you may find hiring managers to say, okay, well, you don't have healthcare. Then your way around that is either to find a more enlightened hiring manager, that could be a clue, or you could go teach yourself something and say, I'm really passionate about this area, whether it's a class or weekend thing or just a bunch of independent reading about what that group or company is doing. It goes in and shows, because the reality is healthcare is a very complex ecosystem. It's a lot of jargon. There's a lot of regulation. The financing is very peculiar. So if you're really passionate about it, it's really something you can teach yourself. But you don't. But I. But I. I don't want to give you the impression that you've got to be kind of. It's one of these career things. It's like okay, well, I'm either all in or all out. Mm -hmm. What you the specialty you're bringing is really the key. Again, whether you're a designer, a developer, or a data scientist that's what you need to be world class at. Yes, you need to know the jargon and how the healthcare system works to be able to navigate in it, but that's um, something you teach yourself, really, I think. Yeah, and I think I agree with both of them. I don't think you necessarily need experience in healthcare to be able to um, get into it or get interested into it. Um, I think that, I guess that's life, is approaching all these different situations where you don't have any experience in them and just being able to figure it out along the way. I think it might help in understanding the jargon, um, and one way that you might be able to do that is start volunteering at maybe some clinics or some hospitals. Mm -hmm. So that way, at least you get to interact with some of the healthcare providers, learn like what it's really like um, from their perspective day to day, uh, be able to see patients and kind of really experience that whole, uh, you know, morning to night shift of working in the healthcare field. Yeah, one caveat to my answer is that was in response to if you're coming into like a, a role like product manager or something like that. If you're trying to be a nurse, you should probably go to nursing school. <laughs> yes, very true. <laughs> I know, because I teach nursing students. Um, so one of the other kind of topics I wanted to talk about um, was just um, around skill sets. Um, so uh, this question is for Melissa because I'm always fascinated every time I talk to her as a nurse and a clinician. Like, I feel like making the leap to Microsoft from being a clinician is a huge leap and I'm always really interested in how you do that. Um, so can you just talk about your skills and experiences um, clinically and in healthcare um, that you think help get you hired at Microsoft and any of those skills that you use in your design research work there? Yeah, definitely. So I think it it started because I'm, I'm super passionate about writing and learning. So I, I started a blog where I was writing about things that I was really interested in, which happened to be psychiatry, which was my specialty, and also healthcare, and then technology. Um, and Microsoft happened to come across my blog and contacted me and had me start kind of traveling around with them, um, giving them some feedback around how clinicians might use their products or how their products could be improved uh, for clinicians. So I was, I was primarily giving them my perspective as a psychiatric nurse practitioner. And then of course, um, through those experiences, I was able to meet some people who had connections at Microsoft, obviously, and they became interested in me primarily for my psychiatric background and my understanding of human behavior, which is primarily what uh, design researchers at Microsoft do. We study uh, people and try to understand um, people and their personality and translate those insights into recommendations to help product managers and developers and designers create products that people will actually want to buy. Uh, so that's, I guess, ultimately how I made it to Microsoft. And I think it really started with just kind of following m the things I was most interested in and I was most passionate about, which were healthcare, technology, and writing, and then kind of just putting my voice out there on the internet. Yes, and Melissa does have her own website if you want to check her out online. <laughs> Um, and then um, the next question is for Cassie. You sort of talked about um, going to a startup to learn all of those things, but how did you build your skill set up as a designer as you moved through all of those different companies to eventually co-found um, a startup yourself? Great question and a big question. Um, so initially I started as um, a PM so more on the product side, but I found myself natu naturally gravitating towards uh, more of the UX side of things. Um, 
as a PM at a startup, I was both kind of product manager and project manager, meaning I was managing what are we building, but also the nitty gritty of like, let's get the project broken down into tiny pieces and schedule it out and figure out what's in this sprint and getting into the real operational side of development. Um, and that part was necessary, but was not the part I was in love with. I was in part in love with not just what are we building, but how are we building it? How does it work? What's the workflow like for the user? Are they having a joyful experience? And to me, that means um, they feel like they know what they're doing in the application. And indeed, they do know what they're doing in the application. So they go through it with confidence, and at the end, they've achieved what they think they're going to achieve, and they feel great about it. There's no like, oh, I think I'm doing it right, and they get to success, but they still feel crummy in the, after using it. It's just bliss the whole way through. So that was my goal. And so I was a very UX-heavy PM at the startups I was at, and uh, and I decided, and this is probably a good topic for this panel, I decided to take a calculated risk in um, in w my career choice and my path, and uh, I was had climbed the ladder in one direction, but realized I really wanted to be over here in this direction. So I actually jumped back down to jump over to another ladder and took a role in the UX team and started working my way back up that way. And I think it was Mao Zedong once said, you have to sometimes take one step back to take two steps forward, and that was exactly what I did in my career. And yeah, it was a road bump, but it, I was so happy. I was so happy, you guys. <laughs> I loved doing it. Uh, I was still, instead of a UX heavy PM, uh, or yeah, instead of a UX heavy PM, I was a PM heavy UX person, because uh, at a startup, you still always pay, play lots of roles. But my primary goal then was the user experience. And uh, within like nine months, so I was running a, the team again. And so it, it was a, a momentary lapse in having to take a step back, but um, sometimes really, really worth it if, if that's what you want to do. Like life's too short to keep climbing up the wrong ladder, you know? Um, so uh, for me, it was really learning by doing through those things, just sinking more and more time into reading books about the user experience process and uh, user-centered design methodologies, learning from great mentors. I had some wonderful bosses, and probably the most important thing you can pick in picking a role somewhere is who am I working for? Do I want to work for this person? Am I going to learn from them? And, and also, I learned from the team that reported to me, too. Um, you know, I tried to pick people who were smarter than me, and uh, we covered each other's gaps well. So. Uh, one person in my team could teach us all about one thing and another person in the team could teach us all about something else. And as the manager, I still learned a lot from my team and I could teach them things as well, but we all kind of continued to uh, raise each other's tides together. So um, over time, I became better and better at UX and, uh, and fell more and more in love with it. Um, and then, Mark, so you have a bunch of people working for you in the Digital Innovation Group. Um, what do you do for your employees there to help them build their skill sets if they came to you and said, this is sort of something I want to do? How do you help them along that within such a large organization like Providence? Yeah, I mean, I mean great question. I mean, one of the things that we, what, you know, and if I'm interviewing somebody, what I will always ask them is, what would they go learn and do if if their job allowed them to do anything, right? And what I, or I might ask the question is like, you know, if I could just give you six months to go learn something, what would you, what I'm really trying to figure out is what are they so passionate about that they would do it even, even if it wasn't their job, right? Because we can all put ourselves into the wrong ladder or maybe, maybe it's 20% there, 30% there, but if it's not truly in your gut, because at the end of the day, the most important thing is what do you love learning about that you would do it anyway? Because the world is changing so fast. It's not about my skill today. It's about where I'm gonna go and, and what kind of state of the art I'm interested in keeping, keeping up with. And so we do, to answer your questions, we do, we do lunch and learns. Um, it's a little bit of a, of a carrot and a stick. We just say, look, I'll send you to a conference, but if you're gonna come to that conference, you gotta come back and you gotta teach to your peers. Right, and so you got to come and, and spread the knowledge, right? And so it's and and, and we we use this phrase 
I'm, I'm a big believer kind of culture trump strategy, right? And you got to build the culture. And, and the top line of our culture statement says we're a learning organization. And that doesn't mean, hey, just we're interested in learning about our patients and we're interested in learning about healthcare. But every person in every role needs to be passionate about what work they're doing. And so we are really kind of set that out as kind of our, our top line culture statement is, hey, I may be doing a, a, a project that's learning about a patient, but I might be doing a DevOps or I might be doing, you know, some piece of infrastructure that is nobody in the outside world sees. But if you're passionate about that and you want to learn to be the best, we're going to support you in that. So two weeks ago, we had a hackathon. Actually, I'd say every six months we do a hackathon. Two hackathons ago, it was the typical hackathon. Get a bunch of developers and say, hey, go develop something. This one, we said, hey, let's actually do kind of a, um, a customer hackathon. I was like, what does that mean? Well, let's put the designers together with some engineers. And some of our teams didn't write a single line of code. It was all about design or it was all about problem statement. So we're really kind of passionate about this whole idea of creating a learning organization, fostering people. Because I 100% agree with you. Everything I know, I know because I have worked with somebody really smart who taught me something. And so we really kind of say, like, leadership at every level you've got to teach your peers and so um so also for you um i noticed on the digital innovation group website you are hiring for a bunch of engineers um but when you recruit and hire people into those non-software product pm designer researcher roles um what are you looking for when you hire those people what experiences are you looking for people with healthcare experience without healthcare experience uh, in both and so that's not the defining factor. We like to, we try to have a mix because obviously healthcare is a complex ecosystem. The, the, the number one thing we think about, especially in the non-software developers, is this whole idea, especially being a product development organization, that a feature is not an outcome, right? I get no credit for building and shipping code if that product doesn't drive the outcome that it was designed for. And, and I've built lots of great code in my career that nobody bought or somebody bought and was unhappy with. And I've learned the hard way coming to the rank as an engineer is to say, okay, I ne really need to be passionate about this design stuff and about product definition and product management because it's where the rubber meets the road that if you're gonna really have an impact. So, so when we're talking to especially non-engineers, it's like, okay, what have you worked on? And do you really have that mindset that thinks about who is my customer? What do they care about? Wh you know. Um, trying to think of the, the there's a um, I'm blanking on the on the author's name um, but she's got this a great book she, or she call, talks about the minimum badass user and it's this idea that a Photoshop user doesn't want to be a great Photoshop user they want to be a great artist so really thinking about your customers so again to the non-developer roles and even in the developer roles but are you really passionate about who is the people you're trying to affect and have you done that in previous roles and are you in tune with that? And have you really built something that has actually moved the dial somewhere? So, um, I think we have time for about two more questions, then we'll turn it over to um, audience questions. Um, but for all the panelists, um, where do you see healthcare companies um, continue to have strong needs um, in the future in technology and innovation um, and the largest areas of growth in the next few years that we can prepare ourselves for skill set wise and to be looking ahead for those market trends? Well, um, I think I said it when we were talking back there, but um, one of our advisors often says, uh, he works for a CRO and he says, we're at the cutting edge of science, but the tailing edge of technology. So I think it really is on this um, product side that the, the three of us are kind of sitting in that um, there's a lot of room for improvement, specifically around user empathy and caring about the product definition and design because uh, in enterprise software, good usability is a new defining characteristic that differentiates your product. In the past, you could get away with bad usability. Not anymore. It's 2017 and markets are, people are t starting to take notice of like, wow, our, our people, our team is more efficient if there's great usability here. Um, in the past, the person who writes the check for the software is often very removed from the person who has to use it every day. And so bad usability was everywhere in enterprise software. And when you drill down to a niche like uh, life sciences, it gets even worse. Uh, so I think there's a lot of room for 
awesome user experiences in life science and uh, great user research is going to drive that. Great product people is going to drive that. S developers who have a lot of user empathy is going to drive that. Uh, so lots of room in, in all of those areas. And uh, those are the skill sets I would drive towards development and product definition and design. Um, one thing, I guess, related to this that I've thought about before is how there's just like this infinitely ever increasing amount of data that is being collected and derived and but what hasn't quite caught up with that amount of data is the the meaning that we're getting from it and so something at least at Microsoft that we look for in a lot of our employees or our researchers that we're hiring is people who can do a good job at finding meaning in the data so people who have really strong quantitative skills and data analytics skills um, and then also people not only who have those skills but are able to communicate uh, that meaning to designers and developers and other people so that they can actually build products with it in an effective way. So you, b you both just stole my, my top two, right? <laughs> the, the, the first one is all about engagement, right? The future of healthcare, whether it's, whether it's fee for value or whether it's high deductible plans, it's all driving toward partnership in health rather than transactions of sickness. That's all about great design and engagement in relationships. And part of that relationship is having massive amounts of underlying data mm -hmm. such that we can personalize those experiences. And so that's some hardcore technology that's coming down the road that's going to couple with those that engaging design to allow it to be a very personal interaction and to scale well through technology and be more cost effective. Yeah, I personally cannot wait for that to happen because we use still so much paper and collect all this data. Um, we should talk. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> it's like, yeah, exactly. And exactly what you're trying to eliminate with NVO. Um, yeah, so I can't wait for that data to become more usable, which is why I was so interested in um, Empower and Wellpepper because it's trying to design things for the patients that actually work for them, but then also engaging the providers to actually look at that data um, and make it usable and then give some feedback back to the patient so that the patients just aren't generating this data that's going into the ether somewhere that nobody is looking at or giving them advice or feedback on. So um, yeah. So I think uh, I will turn it over to the audience. If anybody has any questions out there, I'll just come around with the mic. Anyone? There's so many of you here, somebody has to have a question. <laughs> sure. Career perspective session is, have you hit any big potholes in your career that you'd like to tell us how to avoid? What's, what's happened that you just say, oh, I, I wish I had a mentor to warn me about that in, the, in advance? I'm happy to start with that, and I've had a lot of potholes. <laughs> um, I think um, the, the two that immediately come to mind is the, the second startup I was in um, was, I was there for nine years, and, um, and the founder was a very successful and wealthy businessman. We said, this guy must really know what he's doing. And, and had the Lean Startup book been out seven <laughs> years earlier, I would have gotten out of that startup in two or three years rather than nine years. So there's a, there's a phrase out there called the walking dead, right? And it's a company that does just well enough to survive, but not well enough to thrive and not bad enough to die. You don't do yourself any favor by hanging around for a sense of loyalty. And so one of the things that, that you talked about, when, which I think is really important to think about, and it's a little selfish, but to say, okay, well, what is this company or this startup, what am I learning? And when that learning plateaus off, and I'm now in survival mode, and I'm, you know, I'm loyal, and I'm in there for the gusto, well, you got to have a tough conversation with yourself and say, am I, am I really getting anything out of this other than a paycheck, mm -hmm. right? And am I doing them any favor by kind of hanging around? And is this company really have a place to go, or is it really a Walking Dead? So I know it's kind of old, but read the Lean Startup because boy, boy, I made a bad mistake with a lot of years. But the second one. Um, and, and this is really, it's, it's, I guess it's sort of a pothole, but it's also maybe one I'd a little bit better. And in no disrespect to Amazon, the group I joined at Amazon was in mid-meltdown. What I didn't realize was three months after I got there, the GM was sent on sabbatical. 
the, the next three layers of management all either quit or moved within Amazon, truly the whole organization melted down. And I said, at this point in my life, I know I've, I've been around long enough, it's just time for me to move on, this is not a good fit. Um, and, and it was, you know, had I known that, I don't know, it was kind of not in the press bef before I made the decision. I called a bunch of people, and there were a bunch of ex-Microsoft people, and they were like, oh, Amazon's great, you gotta come here. Now we all kind of know there's, there's a, it's a kind of a tough place, but there's a lot of great places. I don't want to kind of beat up on Amazon, but I, I said, seven weeks in, I said, this is not for me. I've been around the block, I'm old enough, this is not a good fit, it's time for me to start looking. And so I was sort of a pothole, but I kind of recovered. You say yeah. this startup is walking dead. So the question was, well, how do you know that it's the walking dead? Yeah, I think it, it, it really comes back to, and it's not just um, the, so the, the, the mentor to the guy who wrote the Lean Startup is a guy named Steve Blank, and you should probably spend, he's a million YouTube videos, and other people have written about this whole idea of product market fit. And it's really about the velocity at which your product is converging to fit with a market. And if, you, and if you're not seeing that convergence of I've got my product hypothesis, and it is just a hypothesis, and I'm learning about it, and I'm getting signals from the market. And if you're pivoting and pivoting and pivoting and pivoting, and you're jumping from industry vertical to over here, or trying to, can't decide whether you're a platform company or you're a product company. I mean, we made all those mistakes, right? We had a pr platform the founder loved. We were trying to shoot into products. The customers were buying a little bit of product, but nobody was buying the platform. So it's, it's really kind of saying, what is this organization about? Is it going in that direction? Is it converging there at a decent clip, right? And you gotta give a little bit of forgiveness and a little bit of stick to it in this. And I, and I kept having this phrase the whole time and friends would say, you know, it's darkest just before the light and you hang in there long enough and you're gonna make it and gosh, we're, you know, we have, you know, persistence. Yeah, at some point you just gotta call a spade a spade and just say, okay, this is not working. Um. I would also echo that uh, a pothole I hit was being too loyal for too long, but you covered that well. So um, uh, I, I've read in some reports somewhere that people, you know, they generally make a little pay raise every step along the way through review process annually, et cetera. But the people who really make money are the people who switch from company to company and get like the much bigger. <laughs> boosts in their career trajectory at each move. So some food for thought there. But um, the one I would bring up is really, whether you're at a startup or a really intense um, big company, uh, you really have to set yourself up for success by not saying yes to everything. And that was a hard lesson for me. Like boundaries are a thing, a good thing. Develop those muscles uh, because if you say yes to everything, you're gonna. Do, you might even succeed in doing everything, but you won't do it super well. You might end up doing a lot of it quite poorly. So it's it's better to be realistic about what you can deliver and set expectations. And one of my mottos has always been under promise and over deliver. And if you can do that in your role again and again, you know your boss is always going to know you're dependable. Your team is always going to know you're dependable. Your uh, employees are going to always know you're dependable and that really goes a long way. I'm not sure if this counts and it's kind of related to what you were saying but um, something I've kind of learned along the way is don't don't be scared to say yes to something that you're not a hundred percent sure how to do yet um, and the first time that happened to me was right when I was finishing up school and I had a professor approach me and ask if I would be interested in designing a new uh, psychiatric nurse practitioner program for a university and I was like no I can't I don't know how to I have no idea how to do that and she was like Melissa I have faith in you just just give it a shot so I did it I gave it a shot and it, it turned out fine and then similar situations kind of happened uh, throughout my life. You know, a, a telehealth company approached me and said, we would like you to uh, consult with us to uh, kind of explain uh, telehealth policy and kind of be there for us. And I was like, no, I can't do that. I don't know enough about that topic. But I thought back to my professor and I was like, okay, well, I guess I could try. I could at least try. Like, what's the worst thing that could happen? Um, so I did, and it turned out fine. And then I kind of like, over time, I realized that you don't have to know everything 
when you say yes to something. And so like when Microsoft approached me, for example, they were like, we want you to be a design researcher. My immediate thought was, what is that? I don't know <laughs> anything about what design research is. But I was like, I can do this. So I just go in and just kind of had faith in myself that I'd be able to figure it out along the way. And I think that if there was any advice I could give people is if you can still say yes, even though you're not 100% sure how you're going to do something. Um, I think a couple, so I was also at a startup and Cassie and I were talking about this in the back. Um, so I basically hit like every startup pitfall for that year um, by working too many hours and saying yes to too many things and trying to learn how to do all of the things from sales and marketing to business travel to product management and design and working with the engineers to sh like going to the clients to ship the products. Um, and still trying to work part time as a clinician because I wasn't entire, you know, entirely sure where the startup was going to go, and I didn't want to lose my registered nurse skills. So I was just doing way too much, and I um, did not set the boundaries. So, um, like Cassie said, it's like about and saying yes, but finding that line where you have a work life balance. If you do decide to go to a startup, um, I would definitely suggest doing a little bit of reading about those pitfalls before you go so you can kind of see them ahead of time before you fall into them. Um, and then my second one was I don't regret my graduate degree in clinical informatics, but um, it was sort of just seemed like the logical place for me to go because there's clinical informatics in hospitals and I was a nurse and that's sort of like where people went um, when they didn't want to practice clinically at the bedside anymore and now that I've gotten more involved in technology over time I sort of wish now that um, if I could go back and do it again maybe I would focus more on the human-centered design and engineering or UX or consider one of the um, programming boot camps that's out there because I'm really interested in learning how to program and do a little bit more of that. So if you are going to go spend a bunch of money on a graduate degree um, or higher education, make sure that it's what you really want to do and try to do some exploration before you commit to a down payment on a house for an education. <laughs> Any other questions out there? Yeah, actually, you just touched on a point real quick I wanted to bring up. Um, from, your, from your perspective, how much actually stock do you actually put into um, you know, those code camps and online certifications? I know we understand that there is the ones that are always there, the PMPs, but some of these new things that you're seeing that I get bombarded with my LinkedIn or my Facebook that I need to have 30, 30 letters behind my name. I just want to get your perspective, at least from either from a hiring perspective, or if you've hired those individuals who have done that, I mean, do you think they've actually learned and has it been valuable to your organization? Yeah, I mean, I guess I'll answer that. I mean, I think, I mean, half the answer is um, code camps are kind of new since I was doing a lot of development or hiring myself. I have, you know, f folks who lead my engineering team. So I do, I'm in some um, engineering interviews, but I'm not actively day to day. But I will tell you, I don't care about any letters after your name, including the PMP. Um, the smartest folks I've worked with come from all kind of backgrounds. Some of them, you know, had great degrees from great schools. The best software architect I've ever known was a guy with a degree in chemistry, right? And he was just passionate about it. He loved it, right? And so that in the interview, I'm not looking after the names after your name. I don't care what code camp you went to. I, I barely care what college you went to. I'm looking for passion. I'm looking for intellect. I'm looking for problem solving capability. Um, we are a team, you know, we're a team sport and along gone are the days of, of designers and developers sitting in dark corners by themselves. It's all scrum teams. So we're looking for that personality. Can you get along with a whole bunch of other people? Um, are you going to be, make the people around you better at what they do? I mean, so those, those, I know that's kind of amorphous, but you know, and, th and there are technical coding tests and we're going to, you know, see what you know, what you're doing and that's, but that's kind of the minimum bar. Right, but I don't care where it came from, and, and there's no letters or code camp or, or degree that's going to really convince me. You know, if you're a you know SD3 at Amazon or, at Amazon or Microsoft, well, God, you know, I, I, I believe you're going to code, but I'm still now going to test you on all those other things. So I don't know if that helps or not. Yeah, I'd like to echo that. I um, was asked to go to uh, one of those camps that I'll, will remain nameless uh, and review lots of portfolios from the graduating class and provide feedback. 
and I'll, I'll say uh, you get out of it what you put into it and there was people there who I was like I would hire this person in an instant uh, and there was other people I was like well I would bring them on as like a junior person and give them a shot and there's some people that I was just like eh, no eh. and uh, it really depended on the person um, and in all the interviews I've done over the years uh, one thing that kind of keeps coming back to mind is you know some of the best uh, CTOs and CEOs I worked for have been dropouts and but they taught themselves how to get the job done and those were the people who had so much passion and drive that they uh, didn't need to go through a formal education process and nobody cared because their code worked and it worked beautifully um, or their designs worked and worked beautifully so uh, if you can get there through studying on your own, to the person who actually asked the question, if you can get there through studying on your own, go for it. If you like to have a group uh, learning environment, go for it. Like what, whatever works for you should be the motivating decision factor and whether you wanna go to a four-year program, a 12-week boot camp, or, uh, or just learn on your own, the, the self-searching you have to do is can I get to the outcome I want at the end of that tunnel? Uh, do I need the extra nudge of the formality of I have to go to this class every Monday at 2 p.m.? Or can I do it on my own? And if you can do it on your own, um, then you know if that's what you want to do, us folks in the startup community really won't care. I totally agree with him. Like we do not really look at degrees. Uh, we look at you know. Can you do the job? And are you a person of character and competence? You know, charisma and charm gets your foot in the door, but character and competence keeps you in the room. So work on making sure you're bringing those things to the table. There's also a lot of a lot of things that you can learn once you start a job with us. You know, we can teach many many things, but we can't teach honesty, integrity, attention to detail, user empathy. These are the things I look for in interviews. I think we have time for one or two more questions. Is the mic out there somewhere? So a lot of us have worked in startups and burned out, like I've mentored startups. So what do you do outside of your work to stay resilient? And how do you, I can't imagine working for a startup. You said nine years, <laughs> <laughs> like a year and a half, <laughs> you know, next. So what do you <laughs> So it's like having a baby. If, if women were pregnant for two years, there would be no children. Let me just <laughs> tell you that right now. So what do you do outside of work to stay healthy? I exercise. I never used to exercise, but then my sister tricked me by signing me up for a half marathon. And so I had to start running. And now I've found that if I don't exercise, I kind of lose my mind. It keeps me sane and keeps me centered. And... Uh, uh, weightlifting and running and y you wouldn't look at think it by looking at me but I, I it keeps me sane and it's the only thing that I don't feel guilty for prioritizing in my life because I know I'll be a better founder if I'd make time to do it because I'll be sick less I'll be sane more uh, it's just better for my whole team if I get a little self-care in <laughs> mm -hmm. I think that's a really fun question uh, to answer. I think it just depends on what whatever you feel the most relaxed when you're doing or the happiest when you're doing and so it's gonna be different for everybody. Um, for me it's I like to do kickboxing because I get a lot of you know that like aggression out that you feel sometimes in corporate America. Um, also um, I really enjoy painting and doing kind of creative things, reading, and then of course I think this is a good one for everybody is just being around other people who make you happy and make you laugh and that can help you stay like calm and resilient over the, the long term. <laughs> yeah, I um, I joined a gym, I joined a gym, but I, I found that the classes work for me because they're exactly one hour long and I discovered that I love spinning classes like within the last year because um, I can just sort of like zone out and pedal the wheels and not really think about anything. I'm not very good at doing yoga or zoning out because it's too quiet. Like I need something a little bit more active um, to get my mind off of things. Um, and then I also belong to several wine clubs. <laughs> oh yeah. So, uh, 
My question is, is so you've, you've talked about what you've done and the leaps you've made, so what do you think your next leap will be? Off the record, of course. Uh, yeah, I was going to say, I'm only, we're only broadcasting to the internet. Hello, boss. See yeah, how you're doing. Um, I, I don't know this is a very satisfying answer, but every leap I made is not at all what I thought I would. You know, like, you know, I mean, literally people thought I was insane graduating with a PhD from Caltech and say I'm going to a dot com. All my classmates are going to be professors. Um, people thought I was insane. You know, I was like very successful. You know, I did it in my third it wasn't a startup, but after the do startups, I did a turnaround, very successful company, it was the CTO of a healthcare IT company, and you're going to Amazon to do what? There's nothing to do with healthcare, and like people just thought I was crazy, and so I'm sure I'll do something crazy again, because it's just, I just want to find something I'm excited about and passionate about, so I can see myself teaching or consulting or going to this completely different direction, but ultimately I like building teams and technology or something. Anyway, that's not a, but, but I'm not a person who believes in planning the future because unless you're going to do a startup where you can really define what it is it's really finding a fit with something you're passionate about and it's not just the the mission of the organization but it's the group of people and it's the time in your life and it's all that other stuff um i feel like i'll be in envio for the long run uh because like i said loyal person but it also it can take seven to ten years easily to really achieve something, especially if you're trying to disrupt something that's so ingrained, like using uh, three ring binders and paper to run <laughs> clinical trials. <laughs> so uh, so that's what I'm working on now. I, in the future, um, I could see myself working at another startup. Uh, I love life sciences because, like I said, putting my nerd p powers towards actually giving myself and my friends and my family and loved ones better healthcare options really drives me. So I'd like it to continue to be in something around clinical trials because that's really enabling our moving forward as humanity, really. Like what are the technologies, medical and otherwise, we're going to bring to the table to extend our lives and extend um, the years, the, the goodness of the years in our lives. Uh, beyond that, I actually am really fascinated by angel investing. Um, should I be able to uh, exit successfully with Invio or another startup? I think I would really like to get involved in that. Um, seeing it from this side has been really fascinating. Uh, we've raised uh, over half a million dollars now, and I've been doing a lot of the pitching and due diligence and talking to investors, and uh, it's it's something that uh, I feel I would really enjoy doing, not just as an opportunity to make money, but as an opportunity to invest back into the Seattle startup community, uh, especially around life sciences, especially around underrepresented founders like women and people of color uh, and people in the queer community. These people do not traditionally get financed very easily. So I think it's a, a money-making opportunity actually because they have a great perspective on a whole side of the market that's sort of getting ignored. So it's a huge opportunity to both serve people in an empathetic way and also uh, make money. So I think there's a great opportunity there. Yeah. So the question was, what's the next big leap? Is <laughs> or could be. Or could be. So I actually, I have no idea where I'm going to be. And I'm actually a planner. Like, I'm like a super planner, plan everything. And one thing that I've learned is that I have no idea where I'm going to be in a couple years from now. So I have to kind of chill a little bit on the planning. Like two years ago or two and a half years ago, someone was like, oh, by the way, you'll be working at Microsoft doing X, Y, Z. I'd be like, no way. So at this point, I'm just kind of uh, going with the flow and always making sure I'm, I'm bettering myself. Um, being around people that are way smarter than me and then um, being like open and willing to try new things. Um, and I could definitely see myself going back to a startup, perhaps a startup that's um, not so brand new or uh, still has startup qualities. And now that I know how to not fall into those pitfalls. Um, and then secondly, I think um, 
I feel like a lot of the things that have happened have just sort of fallen into, like I was at a research meeting one day and I was like, hey, who does the hiring for clinical faculty? I was just curious. I didn't actually, wasn't really intending to do it. It was just sort of one of those things I was sort of curious about. And I got an email like two days later, I heard you wanted to be clinical faculty at UW. And I was like, that's not exactly what I said, but I'm definitely willing to have that conversation. And then it's just sort of like, ta-da, you're clinical faculty now at the University of Washington. It wasn't, ed, being an educator and teaching wasn't exactly planned, but it, for me it's sort of just about um, making connections with people and coming to events like this and just sort of asking the question, and I, I'm always just sort of like waiting for the next thing to fall into my lap um, versus perhaps like going out and searching for it really heavily. But, but I think that was a really great question um, to end on, and we're at time. So um, we have about another 20 minutes or so. Um, there's still some food and drinks around. Um, so if anybody wants to do a little bit more of that and networking, um, thank you again all so much for coming. I think this was a really awesome panel. I'm really excited that everyone was here. <laughs>